Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be giving the INVIX 2020 keynote address and thank Dr. Devendra Biswal for his very kind invitation. I wish this conference all success and being virtual, I know it's very difficult for you, but in a way it's convenient because you can watch it at your own time. And you can also think about what you would like to ask as questions and send them by email or chat or any other format that you like. So let's get started now. Today's lecture is a little bit different from a standard plenary lecture where people talk about their own work. We are talking about a very pressing challenge in India and want to see how we can unite to address this issue. The talk will be on systems bioinformatics approaches in characterizing neglected tropical diseases in India. Without any further ado, I'd like to provide you a very short introduction on human helminth infections. Our own research in this area and why we can uh, have some input into this proposal a knowledge base from India that has been developed by Dr. Debendra Biswal and is very crucial to get this initiative started. The key challenges that we face in addressing these diseases and how to get and eliminate the worm consortium together to seek funding to make this a reality. COVID-19 vaccines are now available from many countries and within a year, which means we can also overcome such diseases if we put our heart and soul together, find the correct backers to get the research funding in, and then we can actually address this issue maybe by next INBIX, that is 2021. So what are helmets and why are they so important in our daily lives? Helmets are worms, and they can be free living or parasitic. And if you look at this phylogenetic tree, they are practically two types of helminths in the broadest classification. They can either be called the flatworms or platyhelminths or the roundworms, which are also called nematoda. They are also called by the organ in which they infect lung flukes, extraterrestrial tapeworms, and intestinal roundworms. Now, most of them are hermaphroditic, that is, they have the sex organs of both sexes, and that is also true of the most famous member, C. elegans, who, which I have just added here by hand, and uh, tapeworms and some flukes. But some of the parasites do have their sexes differentiated, and these are uh, mostly characterized by parasitic roundworms. That is the nematodes. C. elegans is the most famous worm of them all and practically everybody knows about them. Why are they called cyanorhabditis elegans? It's because under UV light, they seem to look a lovely, beautiful blue and you can see them wiggling around here. They are not infectious. They are free living and they are hermaphroditic. So why is it so important to look at C. elegans? Now, just like Drosophila has been characterized over the years, it was Sidney Brenner who actually looked at this uh, worm as a model organism to study the function of each and every single gene to look at development and how mutants can actually affect the functionality of the worm. This was started way back in 1968 with a one page proposal to the Medical Research Council. I know you're going to be laughing because nowadays we write huge documents to get funding, but he was working at MRC and his proposal was looked at very favorably. And by 1968, he had already started getting results. And these were published in 1974. And he did about 300 chemically induced mutants, which affected behavior and morphology. And these were characterized. And almost the function of 100 genes were defined. 
as you can see, these genetic screens took a very long time, a lot of effort to characterize, but he also talks about X chromosome lethals. This is very critical to develop sterile males, which are used as a biological control for many pests and could be applied to parasites as well. So why are humans involved with helminths and how did this all come about? It looks as if we acquired worms a very long time ago during our evolution and migration. And this has been reviewed by Cox in 2002. We acquired them probably from primate ancestors as well as animals. The parasites were already there. They simply nearly moved to a new host and colonized them, predominantly affecting tropical regions of the earth. And as you are aware, these are also uh, countries that are socioeconomically challenged and therefore they are called neglected tropical diseases and not much funding is available to eliminate them because they are not lethal, they are subclinical, but they are a tremendous loss to the economy of these countries. So here is a map that shows you from WHO what actually is the overall picture worldwide. And those that are in orange, those countries have at least five neglected tropical diseases present. India is classified as overall having only about three of them, which is, doesn't look so bad unless you consider some specific areas where these problems are endemic. The evolution of parasitism from Helminth genomes is also being understood today in this work by Berryman. Matt Berryman is in Sanger Institute, and he has been responsible for sequencing many of these genomes. And uh, the coverage is different for each of the genomes, but as you can see, they infect a variety of organisms. They can be free living, but all those with the Hippocratic symbol are human parasites and they cause us enormous damage. So this is a, uh, this also tells you that the free living worms are now few and far between and because they have mostly managed to find a suitable host environment where they can actually get their nutrition reproduce and then cause the host maybe a little bit of illness, but the worms manage to survive. The effects of helminth infection are really stupendous. In humans, they lead preliminary to inflammation, and this is due to the complement activation pathway, uh, that is uh, the innate immune response, as opposed to the adaptive immune response based on B and T cells. So chronic immune responses to helminthiasis can lead to increased susceptibility of all other infections because your immune system is already weakened. So you could get TB, HIV, or malaria. Generally, it causes severe morbidity, and this leads to multiple negative effects overall, poor birth outcome, cognitive development, school and work performance, decreased productivity and socioeconomic development, and this adds to the cycle of never-ending poverty. Because of, the, uh, because of these helminths feeding off their hosts, Malnutrition is one of the most common end results leading to vitamin deficiency, stunted growth, a lot of anemia because there are a lot of blood sucking flukes and uh, a loss in protein or energy leading to anorexia as well. Cognitive changes are the biggest challenge because they lead in later life to fearfulness inattentiveness and decreased social responsiveness. This could be the inflammation. So that is one of the problems that we face. Long-term effects include cancer of the organs that were infected by helminths, 
Uh, an example would be fasciola hepatica, which causes liver cancer uh, in later years. The same is true of lung cancers, as well as several other cancers that have, that have resulted from helminth infestation. The burden of these diseases is vast and they devastate human health uh, and also they lead to loss of livelihood. They can also lead to the complete wipeout of livestock species, rendering people completely at a loss for their income and their source of food. Soil transmitted helminths are one of the primary causes of these disasters and they are abbreviated by STH. Uh, they cause neglected tropical diseases that affect a billion people worldwide. Blood flukes infect more than 200 million people and tapeworms actually lead to about a loss each year of a million uh, hours of work. How did we get into this area? So what is it about the worms that interests us? My colleague Lobin Gasser approached me in 2004, asking me for help to put together and analyze thousands of EST sequences that he was, sequ he was generating for parasitic worms that affect animals. And they also affect humans because the animals can be used as models for the human disease. So Robin is still in University of Melbourne. So I worked on this with him and with Makadam Kamitreva, who's in Washington University, St. Louis. We put together this white paper, which resulted in uh, Makadonka getting the funding from NHGRI to sequence a few of these nematodes. Nematodes being the roundworms, and currently many other worms are also being independently sequenced by other sequencing centers. Three PhD students worked on these projects, starting with Shiv Nagaraj, now in QUT, Ranjita Menon, now in Westmead Hospital, and Gagan Garg, who's now in CSIRO. We have a few genome papers out of this in nature, nature genetics, biotechnology advances, plus we have another 28 papers uh, bringing the grand total to 32 on this effort. So how does that uh, affect India? So when we look at soil transmitted helminths, we note that 2 billion of the world's population uh, actually uh, are affected. The main species in India turn out to be the roundworm, the whipworm, and two species of hookworm. So STH infections rarely cause mortality, but they lead to a lot of discomfort, diarrhea, abdominal pain, low hemoglobin levels, and long-term effects lead to reduced cognitive abilities, intellectual capacity, and therefore lower work productivity, trapping these poor people in a cycle of poverty. The WHO estimates that about 870 million children are affected in these uh, regions, but India alone contributes 25% to the total global cases with about 220 million children affected and they could actually be supported by treatment and preventive measures. The prevalence and control of these diseases is always linked to poor water quality, sanitation and hygiene practices, and also to the low, low socioeconomic status of these affected regions. But it doesn't mean you and I won't get affected. If we went to one of these regions, it's very likely that we are going to get one of these diseases because it's everywhere. Despite the availability of drugs, eradication is difficult because of the fecal oral and skin transmission routes, which lead to rapid reinfection so that there is a state of infection that is maintained leading to chronic helminth infection. 
in the Northeast, there are some special issues to be looked at because we have fish parasites as the major source of helminth diseases. Professor Veena Tandon at the NEHU actually worked on these and reported in 2014 that 19 taxa of fish parasites are present, monogenian, trematode, cestode, nematode, and a single acanthocephalan species. Some of these are, well, are not even known or seen in any other part of India. So people are quite unaware of their prevalence in the Northeast. And the infection could possibly be from raw or in incompletely cooked fish or during fishing handling or preparation. Remember and recall that there is a skin penetration route that is available to these parasites. So even standing in infected waters while fishing could be sufficient to acquire an infection. So Debendra Biswal has put together a database with Professor Veena Tandon as the corresponding author. And this has been available since 2016, sponsored by DBT, I, IBIN, and NEHU. Here we have the Northeast India Helminth Parasite Information Database, which provides a list of 120 species, Northeast statewide breakup of these species and genome and molecular data for four species at the moment, but quite a few I'm told are under sequencing and finalization. But very cleverly, they have used Google Maps that we are so familiar with to show you where these species were recorded thanks to a large number of volunteers and students who collected the data. For one of them, I'm showing you this image. The challenges for the helminth disease eradication are many. It's because in all these years, we have not managed to develop a vaccine or any kind of immunotherapeutic option. Diagnosis is challenging because so many species are co-located. I have a colleague in Spain who is working on parasitic nematodes, and he was using proteomics. And we can bring all these people to provide us their knowledge and expertise to develop diagnostic kits. Because once you can diagnose what the main issues are, there may be some drug that is already available and we only need to figure out a treatment. Co-infections are a further complication because of the weakened immune system. And as I said, this even leads to cancers. So it might be a good idea to stop the infections early in childhood so that the immune system is boosted and can uh, suppress or uh, negate future infections. Parasitic drug resistance is also a big problem. As you are well aware, the malarial mosquito became uh, immune to, uh, to all the drugs that were available. So similarly, we expect that the parasites will one day develop resistance to the currently available drugs. But all this is only pushing evolution in a particular way. And as biologists, you will understand that. And the parasites will always figure out a way to get rid of these drugs using some drug efflux pump. And therefore, we will be back on the drawing board all over again. So this is the geographic distribution of co-infections of helminths with lymphatic phylo phylariasis, onchoceriasis, schistosomiasis, and soil-transmitted helminthesis. And as you can see, there is a great probability of getting reinfection or co-infection across species because of these issues. Potentially, we could use systems biology approaches. And many of these technologies have already been applied to helminths. Some recent papers are listed here and some older ones, but I would like you to think about this as a problem that has many facets. We could use DNA technology to look for, say, schistosoma samples in water samples. 
The DNA of Sister Soma was found in water samples in China by Sato et al. And in this paper, they have reported the methods they have used. CRISPR has been used in 2020 and applied to several helminth parasite species. I will show you a few more slides on this uh, following this one. It's also possible to use sterile technologies that were developed for insects, pests and parasites. Uh, carriers such as mosquito and this is another project that I'm involved here in Australia where we are looking at suppressing insect pests of fruits uh, which are called the Australian fruit flies and we have done sequencing of those. RNA interference or miRNA uh, can also be used suppression of RNA or specific uh, uh, sex-related genes are very important and can be used for uh, in-situ sterilization of males. New drug-like compounds can also be looked at. We did a little bit of that work way back in 2011 using cheminformatics approaches, and we can use machine learning to learn on the types of compounds we already have and apply them to the problem faced in the nematode uh, uh, situation. I, I mentioned to you that CRISPR can be used very efficiently. Do you at all have reported their results on numerous helminths? And this is one of, that they have shown for the life cycle of a roundworm, uh, Esther Corrales. And uh, they have shown that the CRISPR technology works best in the free living adult worm. But for others, such as Ophistoccus viverini, uh, we see that three areas can be targeted. Uh, the metacercariae, newly existed juvenile flukes, which are here, and uh, the adult worms. So all these have been successfully targeted using CRISPR technologies. And in the case of Schistosoma mansoni, uh, we can use uh, CRISPR on eggs, sporosis, and the adult worm. So the, these are all the situations that are shown here. But to do all this, we need to understand what is the life cycle of these organisms? Who are their carriers? How can we suppress them? How can we get to them? And what methods would work? So we need a lot of input into how we can do this. So systems biology or putting together a lot of different facets may be very important. And it's heartening to note that two previously approved antihelminthic drugs uh, for, uh, for livestock treatment have now been approved by the FDA for human uh, helminth diseases and they can be used for fasciolysis. As I said, this is due to fasciola hepatica and could lead on to, to liver cancer. And therefore they are trying to prevent further diseases by controlling fasciolysis and also oncocerciasis or river blindness using moxidextin. These structures are complicated. They are chemical molecules uh, and we need to understand their structure and their function and also an element of toxicity before we can actually develop new drugs. So we need different types of technologies. And in order to create a worm-free world, we need to understand the life cycles of these elements. And if we have 120, we are looking for lots of researchers. So if you're a biologist, please contact uh, Devendra, because I'm sure he'll be able to find a job for you. We need molecular targets for CRISPR-Cas9 approaches. We can do whole genomes quite cheaply today uh, reason at reasonable prices with reasonably low coverage. Uh, we have worked on uh, multiple eukaryotic organisms to show that a low coverage, but with two technologies might actually be enough. Please watch out for our papers. Uh, 
Uh, transcriptomes can easily be developed in any lab. ESTs, short reads are quite normal these days, but the secretome can also be targeted because this is at the host parasite in interface and we are are trying to understand how the parasite is able to suppress our immune response and therefore colonizes. And this is the area that would be very interesting for that. We can actually develop novel drugs by building on existing drugs and test novel compounds. We can look for new candidate drug molecules. We can also try to repurpose approved drugs or even drugs that have been approved for animals, uh, mammals, livestock, because then they would be easier to transition for human approval. So how can we head towards a worm-free world? So we need to actually do all these things. And this can be summarized by this graphic which was developed by Sato et al. as his graphic abstract. We need to find the worms, which is the GIS location. We need to sequence them or understand their molecular targets so we can do some intervention strategies. Diagnostic kits are required, which can rapidly identify the species. We also need treatment options so that once the diagnosis is done rapidly, in the farm or the streams or the waterways or in the fish that we eat, we can then apply medication to the people who are infected and then hopefully we will head towards a worm-free world. We need to have some targets for this. If COVID could be done within, within a year, we can surely try to do something by next year and for that, we need an Eliminate the Worm Consortium of Experts in genome sequencing, analysis of the data, genome editing and RNA interference, uh, parasitology, animal models for these diseases, drug design, immunology, medical technology for diagnostic kits, field and hospital test teams, and we need funding Maybe Bill and Melinda Gates will be interested. Maybe we can look for some Infosys funding, but these are all our options. But we need to unite first and do this job together. So with some acknowledgments to Devendra uh, Prashant, Bioclose founder, my colleagues for introducing me to this can of worms, my previous PhD students for all their hard work, and all of you for a patient listening. I thank you, and whatever questions you have, we can either do them on Zoom or we can, you can email me your questions. Thank you, and good luck to setting up a systems biology consortium for addressing these helminth parasitic infections. Thank you.